thank you everybody for coming tonight, today, this afternoon. For me, it's almost evening now. I just flew in from Boston. Uh, I'm John Fair. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Coping Corporation. So today, the title actually is changed a little bit. We're going to talk about the future of AR and VR. It's both items. And I'm going to go a little bit ahead of that schedule and talk about a summary. But what, what I'm going to talk about today is I think the, the VR and AR, actually, the future is very bright. In fact, it's here now. The tipping point has been reached. And what I'm going to convince you today is that we have reached the tipping point. But we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. Let's go back and start the talk. Well, we're a public company, so my CFO told me I have to show you this slide. <laughs> but it's actually, uh, it's actually about a 30 years quest to go to AR, VR. Uh, a lot of people probably do not know about coping. Uh, we actually spun out from MIT about 30 years ago. And we did quite a lot of things. In fact, if you carry a cell phone with you, a smartphone, uh, there is a transistor in there, a power transistor that actually we created. And everybody uses it. However, we also do micro displays. We're the world's biggest micro display company. The micro display actually started very early. Let me go back to the earlier one. Can I go back to the previous slide, please? I don't use uh, another sort of previous one. I go too fast. Yeah. It actually started in 1990. So 1990, when we were just coming out of MIT, DARPA calls in and call a bunch of the industry people. In 1990, you know DARPA, they started the internet, they work with NASA, they so started the IC. They say, we would like to have mobile soldiers have a computer on their head. 1990. And at that time, we only have desktop. And the desktop monitor was a CRT. So the question is, how are you going to do, put a desktop computer onto your head for the mobile soldier? So what we did is say, the first thing most important is the display. You've got to have a good display, and you've got to have a solid-state display. So we proposed a way to make a solid-state l course. But the l course is transparent, so they can put a bed light right after it, just like the way you use your laptop screen. So it would be a very small form factor. That was the first time ever anybody proposed like that. And DARPA gave us, with the company at that time, about 30 people, they gave us $10 million a year for five years. And that's how we developed the, uh, the first small micro display, solid state. And once we did that, we actually did it in two years. You can probably see it. IBM immediately used our display, make a mobile, hands-free, not hands-free, actually, a computer. <coughs> At that time, there was huge publicity there. And then, of course, Boeing, Hughes, everybody make uh, sets for the soldiers. But it didn't work, not because of display. It, it didn't work because it did not have the cloud. So everybody carried a little computer around their belt. And it was not hands-free. There's no hands-free interface, so we use uh, keyboards. So it's not hands-free, it's not hands-free, it's not uh, really a mobile computer system. So we stopped, everybody stopped after all this money. So we use our mobile uh, micro display to go into camcorder and camco uh, cameras for their electronic viewfinders. We replaced the CRT at that time. There was a little micro CRT was using. And we ship over 35 million micro display, LCD display. We're the biggest micro display manufacturer at that time in the world, certainly the biggest LCD display in the United States. But since then, we actually start going back to the wearable. Five years ago, we sold our business on a power transistor for cell phone. We believe the next platform is coming. It is the wearable path platform. So we went to, actually, we went to stealth mode in the last five years, developing what we think the missing pieces that's necessary for AR and VR. And what I'm going to talk today, in fact, it's not the first talk. We 
came out of the stealth mode since January in the CES. I gave another talk yes, uh, last week in the Society of Display in Los Angeles. Today's the third talk. But this talk, we're going to more focus on AR and VR, especially how things are developing right now. I think the most important thing to ask is, why do people need AR, VR? I mean, everybody talks about AR, VR, it's so hot, and we're obviously a believer of it, right? So being <clears throat> I think you really have to look, go back to the next slide, please. Uh, previous slide, please. Previous slide. I think the first thing to know is really that what is the use for? We think the AI, the use for is to make human beings more powerful, more productive. You want to give the information on the go. You actually improve your world, improve everybody's world. However, virtual reality is different. You actually create the world. You give you an artificial world. Okay. These are very different. One is give you, make your human more powerful. The other one is actually create a dream world. Mixed reality definitely transforms the world. But I would focus today is really AR and VR. And what will make it work? We now know why we want it. Can we make it, make it work? First of all, I actually think AR, VR had to, also had to be headsets. Okay? There are a lot of wearables around, as you well know. And, uh, <clears throat> so, but what I believe is all the wearables should be something that you wear. Even today, you look normal. I, I think this is where uh, a lot of things people don't understand. Of all the 30 years we built it from government, built for soldiers, built for other applications, we found out that people do not want to look funny. Okay, so wearable has to be around, around the head. <clears throat> so, this is, so everything looks normal. I think this is the thing that I think a lot of people are missing it. You should live normal. The second thing you need is headset is the ultimate device because every, most, almost the human sense is around your head. So now you know AR, VR should be headsets. Also, those headsets should be like eyeglasses, should be like sunglasses. It should be not looking very normal. The big ones, the systems will not work well with the people. So go to the AR case. How do you make the AR work? Well, if you want to be an eyeglasses, you somehow have to make your display, your optics, Embedded. Best is the embedded into the frame, like this. You put right in the frame of the air glasses. Then, you, of course, people look like you're totally normal, right? The second thing you need to do, which I think that we learned from the early days with the DARPA days, you need a very good user interface. The interface nowadays, like a keyboard, touch screen, does not work for wearable, it certainly does not work for eyeglasses. You don't want to touch your eyeglasses all the time. So what we need to do is develop a whole set of voice control, hands-free gesture, new interface. So I will first focus a little bit on, on the voice part. We have a talk tomorrow by Dr. Fan tomorrow afternoon to talk about the voice. Actually, the voice engines are around everywhere. You can get voice very well. The problem is really the noise. Okay, in the military field, we already solved the problem, right? In military field, it's very, very noisy. In the factory, it's very, very noisy. But even in the consumer world, it can be very noisy. And this is the one, the speech recognition. Remember, it is a new interface. It's a speech recognition now. We plot it. With our whisper technology, it is um, it's over 90% accurate, even in a very, very noisy nightclub. But this is the leading cell phone, and this is a leading earphone. This is actually very important. This is a, the new interface, the new touch. Okay? So if people want to learn more about it, come to the talk tomorrow by Dr. Fan by, of our company uh, at uh, around 2.15 2 tomorrow. So I will not go talk anymore about voice if we have enough people to talk about it. <clears throat> but we also have a lot of systems built. Remember, we provide displays and optics for almost everybody that you know of. Uh, in the early days, we do all for this enterprise, Fujitsu, Motorola. Then, of course, you Google Glass for consumer, they long go to enterprise. V6 for enterprise. And the recent ones, the Recon and Garmin, they all use our display and op some of them use our optics 
for this application go all the way from enterprise to consumer. They all have some success, but it's not total success. The total success is the next one. We are totally we want in the military world. We work on all the avionics helmets, AI helmets. In this country, in the world, other than China and Russia, they all use our display. We have about 95% market share. This AI display uh, helmet, it looks like a regular pilot helmet, but yet you actually can see in the dark, you can see in the light, you can see 360 degrees. It's the most advanced helmet built. It's for F-35, which is the most advanced drone fighter, fi uh, drone strike fighter, where the sole display supplied with the application. So in fact, we are the sole supply to most all the avionic helmets in the world. And this is the LCD. The LCD is very, very bright. How about this one? This one is another AR, very, very big successful in AR. This is actually a simple gun sight. It's a gun sight for US Army. You see the, <clears throat> the picture with, with, a, with all the uh, computer uh, crosshairs and uh, uh, target shooting. You, you're probably hard to believe. We ship over 200,000 of this thermal gun site to the world. It created $300 million revenue for Copenhagen. 300 million. It's one of the most successful simple minded ARs units. How about go to more practical use? Well, last year, we decided to use our thermal, our thermal uh, viewer idea to put into the fireman helmets with the Scott helmet. We put right at the thermal, the, you can see through the smoke, you can see through the fire. The product came out, it's an AI product. The product came out middle of last year. Tens of thousands of them already sold. And it's very hard. Everybody now wants to build that, uh, uh, this type of AI helmet for the firemen. It saves lives. No firemen want, don't want it. So this is immediate success. Introduced middle of last year, tens of thousands already shipped. So let's call, talk about what's the next step for the consumers. Remember, everything should look normal and look real. So five years ago, we look at what do people wear on their head? What do people wear on their head? Well, certainly you can do a, you, you can do a safety glass or people wear certainly goggles and earphones, has sunglasses and regular glasses, right? So what we did is we, in the five years, we've been many models making to smart, but yet look like that. And we through many iterations. And as we go through the iterations, we found out what's needed, what's wrong, what's right. The ultimate one is, of course, this one. A regular eyeglasses I was talking about early days. How can you get regular eyeglasses and yet you can have the display, everything in there? Let me show the next one. Let's show the video. We actually, actually we built one about 18 months ago. Can we have the next video? Oh. We've lowered our heads and tied our hands to stay connected. But now, there's a better way to experience your world with smart eyewear that lets you see, hear, and communicate. Hi, honey. Hi. I'm at the restaurant. Our table's ready. Great. I'm on my way. Copen. The world is looking up. Unbelievable, this actually is a real eyeglasses. It works, it works 18 months ago, and it has embedded display, optics, everything on the frame, inside the frame. So you, all you look, the side looking up, and there you have the display. Now, how does it work? Everybody say, how do you make it work? Well, the key is the special optics. That is the, we call the pupil optics. I won't go too, too much detail how it works. But we, we partnered with Olympus. Now, 
many of you people probably do not know what the Olympus do. Well, you know endoscope, right? Endoscope, they put a little fiber into your organ, and voila, the, the, the doctor see what is inside. When we knew that, it's very, very clear. You can see a very, using very small fiber can give you a big image. And it was obvious. I, w- I went there five years ago and said, let's develop something like that for AR. And sure enough, there's the optics, and this is it. There's a little f- small little plate in front of you. It focuses the image right into your pupil. That's what I call pupil. It's very, very lightweight. This is the whole unit. Display, optics, bad lights, electronics, and the whole thing only weighs about a little bit over a gram. It's only about a gram. It's very, very, it's tiny, it's a see-through. Extremely flexible for design. You can put it outside, inside, put it into the frame. Very sharp, bright image, very energy efficient. For some people who want to see it, they can go to our booth and see that particular system. It's a shocking. It's like a little raw, like a toothpick. And yet it works. That's why you can put it in the eye frame, in the eyeglass frame. With that, we actually make a little product. We put this outside for, uh, for sports. We call it solos. And we have a talk tomorrow morning at 11.45, talk about solos for sports. And uh, it's, it's, uh, actually, we ship hundreds of them now for the Kickstart. And the response is very, very good. People really love it. This particular one is actually, uh, go, uh, go back to the previous one, please. <coughs> The other one was actually a previous slide, please. Oh, maybe they. The, the, that one was actually used by U.S. Olympic to use for training. So U.S. Olympic cycling team used for training. Now I'm going to switch to AR, uh, VR. I see in the v- AR case, the problem is not in the display. We have the display for years. We, the L- L- LCD is fine. LCD is fine. The problem is the optics. Now we have the pupil optics. The tipping point is the, t- the pupil optics. And the VR is the other way around. VR, you, you really want a VR to be really very smooth image. You don't want to have blurry image. I think a lot of people don't understand it. Nobody wants virtual blur. You never want to see a large screen that has a lousy image. This is the most important point. People say, well, let's get large, large, large. No, no, no. Large is not the right way. Sharp, sharp, sharp is the way. You've got to have a sharp image to make a realistic image. Otherwise, it's not real uh, reality. That's the biggest point. I think I, I'd like to stress that point. That's a tipping point. People get very confused about large. What you really want is a large window, just like at home. You have a... You want a large picture window. Of course you want a large. But at some point, you want 300-degree movement. So what you need is a large, sharp window with 360-degree movement. So all the other stuff, I think there are a lot of people talk about algorithm, software, content. They're all very important. But we are focusing on the hardware part. The hardware part, the enabling part, is a display. Look at this. I mean, for instance, this is what you see when you put your, the regular VR health things on top. Forget about how big it is. The image doesn't look good. What you really want is the image on the right-hand side. Sharp, realistic image. 3D. So <clears throat> the question is, can we do that? Well, let's look at how to design that. We are now know the display is the enabling part. Unlike AR, there's optics enabling part. Display enabling part. So <clears throat> you really want a very large, a good display that can give large windows. So ideally, of course, if you can get a 3K, you can go all the way to FOV of 100 degrees. Nobody has that. Okay. So we believe the tipping point is a 2K. That will give you around FOV about 470 degrees. 70 degrees is too very, very large. And you have a head tracker. It basically is, 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 is the tipping point. The current display is like 1K, you can always going to get a screen door effect, which is very unsatisfying. There's, of course, this other problem. 
motion lightness, latency, all these things make you dizzy. What we want to try is find out a display that not only can give you a very sharp image, has no latency, low power, all the good stuff. So we believe it should be OLED, not LCD now. OLED has different types of performance, especially good for immersive. So go ahead and develop the 2K by 2K OLED display, extremely small, so you can put it on the eyeglasses. And that is the very big challenge. And we actually <coughs> introduced that January 2017. As I say, January last, as I six months ago, we decided to come out of the stealth mode and announce this display. 2K by 2K, exactly what we want. So you have 2K by 2K to each eyes, right? And the display actually is less than one square inch. Okay, diagonal is only less than one inch. Runs extremely fast. Nobody has reached that speed until us. 120 hertz, extreme high speed, and extremely small. And it's OLED. Okay, does that, I mean, in fact, uh, <coughs> that actually, uh, well, I think, can I go to the previous slide? I think we missed this slide, but I guess it's, if it can't, okay, next one. I guess we missed this slide, but it's okay. So what we want to do now is we want to take this, this display. Our, our goal is trying to make it into the, num the, big, uh, the, the, the best, the number one pro provider. Remember, we provide 35 million LCDs, micro LCDs to the world. We want to provide the high performance OLEDs. And then so that we can create a mobile, uh, we call it a mobile VR. We really believe many of the mobile uh, VR systems are not mobile. And again, uh, we get a lot of uh, feedback on this uh, uh, CES, like a PC, PC people uh, wrote that this is, the, this is the next creation. This is a shockingly great uh, insight thing that uh, it has almost no latency. Okay, this company say, seeing is believing, believing. They look at the display and say, wow, such a display do exist. If you have such display, what happened? Well, that's what we think eventually will happen. Nice VR glasses, just like the AR glasses we built. It's seamless now. The AR glasses with pupil optics buried into the frame give you a seamless AR glass. This one gives you a seamless VR glass. I call it glass. It's not this. It's not this. So we quickly, the display was made only about, uh, about a week before CES, January. So we quickly put the display, try to put it into a moving platform they can see. And that's the one, the reference system that is going to be sh is showing, I think it's showing it in, the, in our booth. It's a reference system, we call it IF, because it's very small. It's 40% smaller than anything you've seen. Okay, displays there is actually two, 2K by 2K to each eyeball, to each eyeball. Very tiny, but we, this is just the beginning. In fact, if I, I can honestly say it was actually the first unit was built last Saturday in Boston. I was in the office. I look at it. I thought it was good enough. Let's show it in this conference. So this is the first time we showed it into the, in the world. Of course, people who know me very well, I'd never be happy anyway, so I'm sure there could be a lot more improvements. <laughs> so with this, even with this, you, you, the, the, the VR is almost real. It's seamless now. You have a very, very sharp image. It's about three, three, three or four times better than you've ever seen in the image quality. Very fast, much faster than anything you've seen. Very small, much smaller than you ever seen anything you've seen. So, it's broke through. It, it, it broke through the barrier. It's not, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's a tipping point. We reached the tipping point now. So I think finally, how do you make it large quantity? I mean, it's obviously just made it only six months ago. So we are recently announced we actually uh, built, we're building the world's most up-to-date, state-of-the-art, largest outlet on silicon factory in the world. And 
I mean, accumulate, we put together a $150 million contribution, and it's going to build in Kunming, China. I was there last month looking at the piece of land. It's a huge piece of land, and it's going to break ground in a few months. And that will be the biggest OLED factory for micro display in the entire world. So with that, I will say this. I think with, uh, with our pupil optics and with the OLED on silicon with 2K by 2K at such fast speed, and uh, th there's actually a lot of interesting things going on in there. The display can go if we want to, if the market needs it, you can certainly go to 3K, 4K at high speed. The architecture and the designs allow to do that. So that's why I say the tipping point is rich. There's really no fundamental technology now staying in the way, in the hardware-wise. I'm sure there's a lot of software algorithms people can improve. On the hardware-wise, display, optics, voice, battery, they are here. The ergonomics, they are here. We already know how the ergonomics work. The user space, the user space case are so here. We know why they're useful, how they're useful. They are here. So that's why I was so optimistic at the beginning. I say, the future is actually now. We are actually standing on the pace where the breakthrough has already occurred, the tipping point is here, and from now on, let's go ahead for the harvesting. Thank you. Thank you.